What is happening? Hugo Mendes with Chaskis here. And if you've been following these videos, you know that I'm currently training for the Dirty Kansa 200. What is the Dirty Kansa 200? Well, it's a 200 mile gravel cycling race that takes place in Kansas. And as part of this journey for me to get ready to complete this race, I'm releasing a series of videos where you will learn through my own experience how to get ready for the DK200. But first, if you're new to the Chaskis channel, make sure to click on that subscribe button and hit that little bell to be notified when I release new videos. And if you're not following Chaskis on Instagram, well, just go there and look for at Chasky app. I'm always sharing information and content on my journey to complete the Dirty Kansa and more. Before we get into this week's video, just want to say a couple things. One is that now that we're dealing with unusual and extraordinary times due to this Corona virus outbreak, I think it's important to see things with perspective and really stay positive and focus on what we can control. And for me, especially is things like getting up early, doing some meditation, um, trying to train, of course, eating healthy, and uh, connecting with friends and family and be smart, right? Just try to stay home as much as possible, avoid public places, practice social distancing and more. And two, a coronavirus update from Lifetime Fitness, which is the company that organizes the Dirty Kansa. Well, I got an email yesterday, uh, March the 17th, where they say that they're monitoring the situation and that they are gonna make a final decision on whether the race um, keeps going, um, it's canceled or postponed, I guess, by May 1st. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm just gonna keep training. This week's video is like a continuation or part B of last week's video. Why do I say that? Well, last week, my good friend Brian gave great advice on how to have a good race strategy to complete the dirty cancer. Brian is such a strong, an experienced cyclist that in my opinion, and he would never use this word, he's an elite cyclist. He has so many years of experience, tons of knowledge. He has trained and raced on courses that are much longer and harder than the Dirty Kansas. I guarantee you that. And that's why I also wanted to get race strategy advice from someone who I believe is more like me, an everyday cyclist, an everyday endurance athlete. And that's why I invited Noah to share his experience and his advice on how to have a good race strategy to complete the Dirty Cancer. Okay, here are my main takeaways from my conversation with a three-time Dirty Cancer finisher on how to have a good race strategy for the DK200. What is your expectation? Why are you doing this? If you're trying to go out there and race and you want to you wanna really be in the top 50 or the top 100 or in the top 10, I mean, if you're, if you're a former World Tour pro, <laughs> yeah. World Tour pro or rider, you could, you could think about that. My goal is to break 18 hours. I came within five minutes of that a couple of years ago, and I think that I'll be able to do that this year. For people who are pros, the expectation that there is that if you start bonking or if you start throwing up, you should figure out a way to push through that and mm -hmm. continue riding. Whereas for someone like you and me, if you're not having fun, if you if you really feel like you're you're putting yourself in harm's way, it's okay to, to mm -hmm. pull the plug. And I've done that a couple of times. Mm -hmm. I've I've been bonked and I have pulled the plug. I didn't stay on top of my uh, hydration one year, and I knew that if I if I kept going past that last checkpoint, uh, I was probably going to put myself in a place where I needed get needed to get in the back of an ambulance and get some get some uh, IV fluid in me. Wow. So yeah. I decided not to, right. and that's totally legit. Right. Uh, it's disappointing, but it's still legit. When I go out there, I want to have an experience of riding with some other people, riding with myself, and challenging myself in ways that I don't necessarily get on a 50 or 60 mile bike ride. Mm -hmm. And it's also an amazing way to shut down the distractions of the rest of your life. There are, there are moments when you're out there when it's very meditative. <laughs> thing that I'm, I've started doing is staying at the Emporia State University dorms. One of the nice things about that is it's quiet. People are 
everybody's doing the race, so everybody mm-hmm. wants to take it easy and be quiet and don't have to worry about anybody being loud. It also comes with some of the meals. You get breakfast and lunch. The dorms are right downtown. You mm-hmm. need to jump on it pretty soon in the day when they become available. Mm. The other advantage to them is they're much cheaper than hotels mm. in the area. Staying on top of that stuff, there's also some Airbnbs. If you can find some friends, you could you, you could easily fi- take out a house together. Mm-hmm. How do I get ready to ride a hu- 200 miles? <laughs> I can tell you what works for me. I start thinking about it kind of in terms of six months out. Probably in January, There's you, you can't ride too much, right? It's, it's mm. We had an incredibly snowy January yeah, here. We had a really right. snowy February. Yeah. So I'm spending time inside. I find that riding my bike inside is just really depressing. I do high intensity fitness classes. You know, maybe you've got an Orange Theory, maybe you go to the local rec center. If you wanna kind of work in some uh, exhaustion training or, or endurance training, you could take two classes back to back. You can get a, a good training load in your legs and the rest of your body and kind of still keep that uh, keep that training going even nice. when it's too unpleasant to ride outside. If riding inside works for you, that's what you should do. <laughs> Training is very personal. The other thing I do is one day a week, I do some strength trainings. Having some upper body strength is really important. In 2015, yeah. we had to carry our bikes for several miles through peanut butter mud. And, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta have to yeah, have, you have to have some strength true. in your arms and some strength in your back to be able to do that. I'll spend five minutes walking around with a 40 pound barbell on my mm-hmm. back to kind of make sure that I'm, I'm feeling okay with that too. Right. Once you actually get on the bike, my recommendation is you start with kind of 50 mile rides and work your way up from there. I think that it's really important to do at least one ride before Dirty Kansas that's at least 125 mile ride. Yeah, you said that on your notes. And, mm-hmm. and maybe farther. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that last year I did a 170 mile ride the weekend wow. before Dirty Kansas. And when I showed up to Dirty Kansas, because I'd just been resting, mm-hmm. I felt amazing. And yeah. then when I when I actually went out to ride, I knew that my legs had that in them. You're, you're going to put so much thinking into your bike setup and your nutrition, and your water, and your lights, and your GPS. You want to make sure that all of that is going to be working when you've been on the bike for more than eight hours. A lot of people who are signed up for Dirty Kansas, they may have done a 100-mile ride before, but pushing beyond that mental barrier I think is really valuable because then you know you can do it. With respect to nutrition, um, what tastes good at mile 80 might not taste very good to you at mile 120. Mm. Um and again, nutrition is super personal. I really like using goo roctane. I know there are other people who really like eating whole foods. They've got burritos and mm-hmm. uh, sweet potatoes and cookies on the ride. There are some people who like other nutrition products. Part of the reason that you want to start doing 50-mile rides and doing them early enough in the season is so that you can know what works for you nutritionally, mm-hmm. how often you need to eat, how much you need to eat. In some ways, if you're a, a well-trained athlete or you're you're used to endurance events, you can kind of fake it for a 100-mile ride in some ways, right? You, you can get by on not really eating enough. You might not like it too much, but you can do it. Mm-hmm. But you cannot fake 200 miles. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're yeah. not eating enough, you're going to end up like me. At, at mile 142, the bottom just dropped out of my stomach. I could not, I couldn't go fast at all. And I ended up just sitting there on the side of the road. I just do straight Roctane drink the whole time. One of the reasons that I like the, the goo Roctane drink or something similar, I've used Tailwind before, and you know, there are any number of, of kind of yeah, drink like your tailwind. calories mixes, is that it, it also simplifies my water planning. Because one thing that's important to know about riding gravel is that you're probably going to be anywhere from one to three miles an hour average slower than you are out on the pavement. Part of that is just the fact that it it's just comes down to the rough surface, right? You're having to expend more energy mm-hmm. to go over the gravel road. And one of the things about Dirty Kansas is that it's all short, punchy hills. There's no, In Colorado, we're used to, sure, you, you ride up to Jamestown, and that's a seven-mile climb, right? You're, or you, you ride up to, to um, Ward, Ward, and that's, that's, a, that's a multi-mile climb. At Dirty Kansas... The, the actual distance traveled might be only, I don't know, three or 400 feet, but <laughs> you're still going up at a pretty, st- at a pretty steep climb mm. and you're doing that over and over and over. So <clears throat> you are um, having to, to put kind of more energy out each time you're going up 
and then mm. you're worrying about descending on that gravel as well. So again, it's a little different from a a road descent where you think, oh, the pavement, this is great. I've got plenty of traction. You need to pay a little bit more attention when you're going down on the gravel, which again, takes more attention and more energy. Mm. So my point being is that you need to have enough water out there in order to take you from checkpoint to checkpoint. And the checkpoints are anywhere from 50 to 75 miles apart. Mm. You, you can't have a, a friend out there with a model <laughs> no. for you to pick up. In fact, somebody got disqualified a mm-hmm. couple of years ago. He had he came in seventh, but he had a friend out there who had been feeding him water. He got he, he got disqualified. I've got 85 ounces of goo roctane in my camel back on my back. And then I've got another two bottles on my bike in order to make sure that I am getting enough liquid and enough calories to get me from point to point. Smart. Um, yeah. And I usually keep one of those bottles just plain water in case I have to wash off somewhere i always hear that i always hear that just bring plain water because there's going to be times when you're not going to feel like drinking the the same you know Mm -hmm. sugary thing that you drink all day you need to have plenty of uh uh uh, salt pills you need to have plenty Mm -hmm. of uh, electrolytes with you you're going to kansas if you're coming from colorado colorado is very dry Mm -hmm. in kansas you actually lose more salt Mm -hmm. in your sweat or at least that's my experience than you do in colorado because it doesn't evaporate immediately your sweat is staying on you so you're actually running a little bit hotter uh when you're out there too i always want to finish with more water i'd I'd rather have more water than i need than too little water because more water it's an extra i don't know like half a pound yeah that's not going to make a big difference but if you're if you're if you are out there and you needed an extra bottle and you don't have it that could be a disaster yeah I definitely recommend you want a bike that, in addition to being comfortable, so mm-hmm. get a bike fit or figure out what works for you, um, you want to be running at least 40 millimeter wide tires, mm-hmm. um, whether that's a 700 or one of the Road Plus tires that's 650B by 47. Mm-hmm. Having more tire is a good thing mm-hmm. um, because you're going to be spending a lot of time bouncing around out there. Mm-hmm. You probably don't have a shock on your bike. Yeah. And so the more air cushion you can have, right. the happier you're going to be. And there are a number of companies that are making tough tires that can that can keep up with Kansas now. Um, you've got Terravail. They have uh, the Rutland, mm-hmm. and, which has uh, a, a, like a bead-to-bead uh, puncture protection belt. Mm. You've got uh, Paneracer, the Gravel mm. King tire, S- Gravel King SK, which has been a popular tire for a while, but sometimes had some some... Uh, sidewall problems uh they've got a new casing on it that has the same sort of thing to protect your tire all the way around and then keep in mind that you can drop your pressure a significant amount right uh i mean i I, with a 650b by 47 tire i'm running high 20s low 30s at most definitely you want to put a new pair on a week or two before kansas okay so what what i do is i'll do my training on one pair of tires oftentimes the pair of tires that i used last year for the race Mm. Right, so I, I, I then train on them. I've probably ridden them over the rest of the summer. So they're they're getting worn down. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm getting my money's worth out of the tires. Right. And then two weeks before the race, you want to order them a little earlier than that. But two weeks before mm-hmm. the race, I'll put new tires on, and then I'll get a ride or two in on them. Mm-hmm. And that way the tires are a little broken in. But I know for sure that there's no bare spots, the tread's in good shape, and mm. the puncture protection's in good shape. <laughs> A GPS is key. <laughs> when, I've had bad luck with Garmin, and I've had good luck with Wahoo. Mm. Uh, I know some people who have had the opposite experience are very happy with their Garmins. One of the things to keep in mind is if you're going to be out there for more than about 12 hours when you're running that the 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 um, the route finding function, you're going to want to have an ex, an exterior battery. You're going to want an ex, external battery to keep your GPS running throughout the rest of the day mm-hmm. and part of the night. And you want to make sure you practice with it. There are places where you can create routes to try out, like ridewithgps.com. Uh, mm-hmm. You can all, and that's also a place where you can look routes up. I know that Strava has a, a route making uh, uh, system as well. But you want to get used to how your GPS tells you when and how to when and where to turn, and just know kind of just get into the habit of looking down at it or listening for the little beep that it gives, yeah. so that you know on race day that. A, your GPS is going to work, and B, you're going to be okay reading it. You definitely want to make sure that you know how to work it. You know how to, if it dies, how to get it started back, get it started back up and working again. And also make sure you've got a, a battery that you can plug into it. 
uh, I just pretty much just plug I plug my battery my external battery into it and leave it there and periodically I'll have to press the button on the battery to keep it feeding juice mm-hmm. but that way I know I don't have to try to put a little mm. uh, 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 oh. USB uh, uh, port yeah. into the USB cable into the into the GPS when I'm tired at yeah. five o'clock in the afternoon right I know that it's just there and I can I can press the button and it's ready to go and again that's something you need to practice with is, is making sure that your external battery is the right size and and uh, uh, attached well and you know how to, to make it work carrying stuff on your bike is figuring out what bags you're going to use for that uh, I've used Revelate Designs bags pretty much the whole time that I've been doing this. So they've got bags that go under your top tube. They've mm-hmm. got bags that go on top of your top tube. They've got bags that hang from your handlebars. Mm. There's a lot of ways to use the use what are bike packing bags in order to help you carry your stuff. Mm-hmm. You don't want to carry too much stuff, right. but you probably want to have two tubes, uh, maybe a little tire boot, maybe some sealant. You want to have a, 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 a small chain tool. You want to have a small quick link tool and a couple of quick links and probably a short length of chain Mm -hmm. you need your tire levers uh, and you need a pump uh, in addition to maybe some some uh, uh, co2 canisters part of your training should be getting really good at putting a tube into your tire or (sighs) fixing a hole in the side of your in the side of your tire the uh, i have the um there's any number of kind of plug kits now that you can use for tubeless tires and what I did last year was I, I took a tire that was kind of dead. I'd ridden it a lot, and I, I knew that I didn't need to use it anymore. And I blew it up, and I put some sealant in there, and I just took a drill and drilled into the side and then used my sealant plug uh, kit to plug it up and make sure that I had an idea, uh, I knew how to use that and that it would work together. Oh, now, that's so- what I'm going to do because I was like, how do I practice? Because I, my tires are already set uh, tubeless, so, mm-hmm. which is great, but... Yeah. Ah, that's good to know. Yeah, uh, so I, I use the Dyna plug. First 50 miles, because it's a mass start, you'll be able to see where everybody's at. It'll be a long line for a people riding for probably the first hour and a half. Mm-hmm. One of the things you have to work on is not running up on people, not crashing people out because you grabbed your brakes in a weird way, but also knowing how to pass people. And so it, it's when you're out there on those roads, it's kind of a two track, right? It's, yeah. it's essentially a, 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 maybe a three track, but it's, it's a dirt, it's a dirt or gravel road yeah. that people have been driving their, their trucks up and down. And so you have the, the nice tracks and where the wheels are, but then in between you might have some deep gravel. And so being confident in riding on that sort of stuff is uh, really something that it, it's important to work on. So mm-hmm. find some, fi- it's, if you, if people can finding some, deep loose gravel or sand to ride on to kind of get a feel for how that is how do you place yourself and how do you pace yourself because it's a mass start uh they allow the racers to organize themselves last year was maybe uh, the cheerleading team from one of the local high schools and they just hold up signs with your expected finish time and those go from i think 10 or 12 hours up at the very front they do call-ups for the professional riders Mm -hmm. and the, the famous folks up at the front but then it's uh, there's a 12-hour sign and a 14-hour sign and a 16-hour sign and an eight, and then I think the 18-hour sign is the last one and then you just all anybody who's 18 hours or slower than that lines up behind that. When you with that mass start, when you're on the pavement, everybody's kind of spread out. But then as you turn onto the first gravel road, everybody's going to be kind of funneling down into two lines, maybe three. So that's probably the most dangerous part of the race Mm -hmm. when it comes to riding with other people because everybody's pretty excited there's a lot of of there's a lot of adrenaline people are wanting to to get going they want to get on course and so someone might make a turn wrong get a little too close to you from Mm -hmm. the side riding defensively is the way to do it at the front I'm a pretty conservative rider around that stuff if somebody really wants to push forward I'm gonna let them go right right if you're finishing in 18 hours or even maybe 16 hours you're looking at finishing in the dark probably mm. anything anything slower than about 15 and a half hours it's going to be a point where you need lights so again this is the sort of thing where you want to you want to get your lights a little earlier and practice with them go out on some night rides because riding at night on a paved road is really different from riding at night on a gravel road you want to make sure that you've got the battery power to get you around you want to make sure that you've got the light throw right you want the light to 
light up the, tr- the road for you okay? Do you put the front light on your bike at the very beginning of the race, or do you put it when it gets dark? So I'm kind of of the mind that I don't want to have to do much fiddling with my bike, especially the later we go. You're tired and right. kinds of things. Yeah, so if, if I'm running a battery light, I'm going to have that light on the, the, the bike already. Uh, and uh, depending on whether I've got someone coming to support me or whether I've got the, the neutral support uh, at the checkpoints, I might also have the battery on the bike as well. Mm. And you're out there on the course, you can see kind of a trail of tail lights up ahead of you. <laughs> cool. uh, when you're when it's night, you're going to slow down. Right? Right. You're probably going to slow down even a little bit more, just because you know you're, the light is is not great, even if you've got a good one, mm-hmm. um, and you are, you know, your body is used to going to bed probably yeah. a little earlier than that, so <laughs> your body is slowing down as well. When you come up on people, or when people come up on you, it's even there's even more camaraderie because we all feel like we're out there mm. in the dark doing it together. Mm. Um, and seeing the little taillights up ahead is something that can help motivate you to maybe try and ride a little bit faster. But it's also the sort of thing where you could, you're looking ahead and you see taillights high up in front of you, and you realize that's where there's a where there's a a, a hill coming up. <laughs> The checkpoints are the only places where you can get support. And that's either if you've got a friend or a family member who drives mm-hmm. out there and meets you. Um, they actually they spend a lot of time figuring out how to make those checkpoints work. So they'll they'll you'll find out on packet pickup day they'll give you a, a colored sheet of paper that will tell you where you need like the parking area for you. You've got the red parking area, the blue parking area. Mm. Usually they're at schools or in the downtown of town. So there's plenty of places to put the car but you need to know where to find each other you've got the blue parking stick the blue parking paper you know that you go to the blue section of parking to find each other got it uh if you are not bringing a support crew several years i've driven out there with a friend who was also doing the race Hmm. uh you can pay money to get neutral support um which is their two uh nonprofits that are are kind of based around supporting children who have cancer Hmm. in the emporia area um, they're nationwide, but they, they're based out of the Emporia area. Mm, and wow. so what happens is, is you, you, uh, you know, pay them some money and they send volunteers out and what they'll provide at each checkpoint is they'll provide some food, like a, you know, some pizza or like a, a mm. foot long subs, that sort of thing. They'll also have water and they'll have a neutral mechanic sometimes. So mm. someone who can put some lube on your bike, or if you're shifting as weird, can fiddle with it. Uh, the one thing they don't do is they don't they don't provide you with your drink of choice, mm-hmm. and they don't have any they don't have extra tires for you they don't have mm-hmm. extra tubes for you they don't have extra clothes for you so but what they do do is they carry a drop bag yeah. for you out to the checkpoint and again on packet pickup day you meet with them you hand them your drop bags they they mark it with your race number then on race day they have kind of the tent that's in the most obvious and first place when you come into the checkpoint so there's mm-hmm. a lot less kind of looking around for your yeah. support crew. If you spend 90 minutes at the checkpoint, if there's two or three checkpoints, that's three or four or five hours that right. you've spent sitting around. Yeah. And if you don't need to do that, it's good to avoid. Mm-hmm. So there are any number of ways that you can cut down on that time. And part of that is just thinking ahead of time. What do I need to do? I know I'm going to need to use the bathroom. I know I'm going to go, I'm gonna need to refill my bladder my, my hydration bladder and I'm probably going to need and if I've used one of my tubes I'm going to need to pull one out if I have a vest that I used in the morning I'm going to drop it off or if I know that I'm it might be getting rainy I'm going to pull a, a, a rain jacket out of my drop bag one, again one of the reasons that I like using the um, drink mix drinking my calories is what I do uh, the night before I drop off the drop bag is I fill my bladder with the powder mm-hmm. ahead of time and so that way, when I get to the checkpoint, I pull the empty or half empty one off my back, empty it out, drop it in my drop bag. And then I pull the new one with the powder in it out and just fill it up. And that way I'm not scooping yeah, totally. as, as, I'm, as yeah. I'm standing around there. If we've got powder in bottles, I'll do the same thing. I'll have two bottles with powder in them. Again, I can just open them up, hmm. put water, put the, add the water, shake them up and go. If you can keep your checkpoint stops below 20 minutes, you're doing pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's, there's plenty of bathrooms. It's always nice. I find to maybe even just sit down for about five minutes and yeah. just breathe. Yeah. The course changes every year. Oh, wow. Uh, what? Yeah. So mm. Each time I think the goal is to have the last checkpoint 50 miles or less from the finish. 
I like to think about it. Once you pass 100 miles, it's all downhill from there. Yeah. And once you hit 50 miles, unless there's something really wrong, you have a good uh, you have a good chance of finishing the race. I've also heard that the last 50 miles or the last section, um, the 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 course is not as the gravel is not as brutal as maybe because in theory at least this is what i heard that uh for people who are riding into the dark you know you don't want them to kill them die of you know like by what you yeah think. Cer certainly the last 25 30 miles but like i say in at mile I think it was probably about 165 mm -hmm. from on in 2016 17 and 18 there was a B road and you were doing this and this and it was rough and rocky and, um, mm. you know, it was the sort of thing where you, you might've been picking your way through it when it was light out. So you, you really wanted to take it, take it, uh, more carefully when it was dark out. Yeah. But yeah, certainly sure. from, from probably the last 25 to 30 miles, it's much more calm. They will be videotaping and they, will often also be taking photographs. So you can get a, a picture of yourself at the end there. Mm -hmm. And one of the race organizers, either Jim Cummins or Leland mm -hmm. Danes or uh, 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 Christy, um, uh, will be there and you'll get a hug from them. You'll get a finisher's high class. <laughs> um, and uh, I, it's it's a really amazing feeling to cross that finish line and to yeah. know that you just did 200 miles. Yeah, I can't believe it. Um, like, I I was reading the the Bible and, and they were saying that there's different types of uh, awards, I guess, depending on, on when you finish. You get a little patch when oh. you finish, depending on when you finish. So, so they have the beat the sun patch. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you beat the sun, uh, if the, uh, there are there's a limited number of um, uh, uh, art prints that one of the, oh. one of the, one of the uh, professors, I believe, over at the college uh prints up so mm -hmm. if, you, if you're in the first 150 people that finishes before sundown which i think they count as 550 in the evening something like that or 650 i'm not mm -hmm. exactly sure um you get one of these prints i think they mail it to you and they, don't, they don't hand it to okay. you at the, at the, at the finish yeah. line and then um if you finish before midnight you get a, a little patch they're iron on ones that says something like mid uh uh midnight club mm -hmm. and then if you finish after midnight you get a patch that says breakfast club <laughs> right? make sure you're planning for after the race too right uh you're gonna want to take a shower because you're gonna be covered in road dirt yeah it's gonna be stuck to all your sunscreen and, right. and all that sort of stuff um you know you're you're gonna be covered in salt you're gonna be stinky so taking that shower is going to be great. Yeah. Um, right. But you want to you want to make sure you get some calories in you because you've just if you if you've been out there for eighteen hours you've probably burned six thousand calories. Yeah. Um, and, and hydrated for sure. Yeah, exactly. So have your have your recovery shake, whatever that is. Have your have your food plan for afterwards too. How do you feel physically the day after the days after? I mean, you'll pr you're going to feel tired. I think if you've trained well, if you're mm -hmm. if you're feeling if you're pretty well trained, you're probably not going to be sore. Make sure you've got chamois cream, mm -hmm. yeah, and make sure you you use it and find something that works for you. Mm -hmm. And what works for a fifty mile ride, you know, might be a pain in the neck to reapply at mile one hundred. Yeah, again, this this is the sort of thing where um, making it as safe as possible so that you have a good race day, instead of trying to you know push yourself as hard as you possibly yeah. can uh, in a way in a way that you haven't planned for and we right. haven't trained for right. so no matter how bad the road the, the the gravel roads are out there if you if you really need a pickup the kansas city jeep club can get to you and pick you up God so damn. you can you can call for help <laughs> um you know you your friend you know your partner you might not want them to drive a honda accord or a honda <laughs> civic out onto these rough roads right You're, you might be break, you might be breaking oh, off dang. pieces of the car when you you're try prius and do that. right yeah exactly don't don't do that um and also that the other advantage is the kansas city jeep club knows where everything is i think the dk etiquette is to look out for each other it's to encourage each other it's to um it, yeah it's it's to be a a positive person out there on the road mm. um there are going to be times when you are in a dark place out there mm. and that's okay uh because the people who come by if you if you're sitting on the side of the road every person who comes by is going to say hey are you okay do mm. you need do you do you have what you need and 
it might be that you're just taking a break, but you can, you can tell them that. Um, and if you really need help, someone's going to be there for you. People are not out there trying to go as fast as they can at the expense of everybody else. Yeah. It's because it's a shared transformative experience. Yeah. All right. That was really cool to get advice from a different perspective, right? So what did you think? Was there anything new that you learned today? Or was there any particular moment from this video that you enjoyed the most? Let me know in the comments. All right, that's it for this week's video. So if you found this content useful, don't forget to like this video. Don't forget to share this video with a friend. Click that subscribe button. Don't forget to hit that little bell to be notified when I release new videos. And also, if you are on Instagram, follow Chesky's. That is at Chesky app. Again, I'm always sharing uh, content and all things on my journey to complete dirty cancer, okay? Please be safe, stay home as much as you can. We are all in this together, okay? It's time to chesky up.